Good evening, Andrew Gilstrap here, back with you. Glad to be back this week. Um, glad Alex gave me the great opportunity to talk about God's inspired word tonight. So bear with us on the lack of quality. Our microphone's not working, but God's word can't be stopped. Amen. So we'll get into it. Last week, we discussed this grand story of humanity in the Bible, focusing on our role as royal priests a vocation given by God. And we talked about how, unfortunately, we, just like Adam and Eve, forfeit that role. We decide what good and evil is on our own terms. We build our own kingdoms, our towers of Babel, so to speak. But Jesus, the perfect royal priest, the perfect human, comes and fulfills the whole narrative of Scripture so we're actually going to dive a little bit more specifically into how he does that tonight by looking at Hebrews 2, 10 through 18. So this evening, I want to ponder three things. The first is the humanity of Jesus. The second is the atonement and victory on the cross. And the third is following the pioneer in this upside down way of life that he lived. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Father, thank you that your word is always right on time, always good. And I thank you that we get to hear it with ears that hear through your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would do that in us and help us respond well and obey you as our King. In Jesus' name, amen. So flip them into Hebrews 2, and let's read verses 10 through 18. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder or pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. It's God's word. So the three points are right here. And the first one is going to be Jesus's humanity as a huge theme in this passage. I think that we're quick to say Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our God. even. But sometimes we don't really think deeply on the humanity of Jesus. And we even read our Bibles like this. The Word of God is inspired by God. Rightly so. But we forget human authors. God used humans, just like us, to write down these inspired words. So I wanted to think through deeply for a little bit Jesus' humanity as it pertains to our salvation. Jesus is this paradox, and he shouldn't just be a one sermon at Christmas about his incarnation as a baby, but this should be something we mull over, we think about, we connect with him in that humanity. As one scholar said, Jesus is the heaven and earth person, and I hope that we can understand a little bit more about that earth person, that earth side of Jesus. But first... I want to call your attention to two resources right below this video on the Georgia's Creek website. The first one is 
the Desiring God article. It is a great article. And it goes through the huma humanity of Jesus. I'm going to pull a little bit from that article, but it is totally worth a read. Maybe 10 minutes. It is so worth a read to ponder. The second is actually a TV show, surprisingly. It's called The Chosen. And don't be alarmed. It's not about Calvinism or some theological debate. The Chosen is actually about how Jesus' disciples encountered him and their perspective of this God-man, this Messiah. It's a great show. Please give it a watch. It is so worth it. Uh, really well uh, filmed and also well researched. And I think they do a really spot on job with it. It's blessed my wife, Natalie, and I. We've showed it to our youth group. We've had discussions. It's really good. So the links are there. You can watch it on YouTube. But just wanted to share those because I think it's going to, beyond my words, could. I think it's going to connect you with that humanity of Jesus in a really special way and lead you to worship. So there's the resources. Let's hop into Jesus' humanity. So Jesus was fully human in body, in mind, in emotions, and in will. So let's think through this a little bit. He went through trials, temptation, suffering, physical pain, emotional turmoil, learning, even growing. Jesus wept. He wept at the sight of Jerusalem's hard hearts. Jesus rejoiced with his friends. And when he healed people, they rejoiced. Maybe even danced. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus built stuff with his hands. Jesus used the bathroom and slept. Jesus ate. Jesus laughed at funny jokes. I'm a plumber, so I really connect with this idea that Jesus, you know, may have been working and a piece of wood just accidentally sliced his hand. And I think, I wonder if he would have like healed himself or, or what he would have done. You know, there's some good questions there. I also connect with him waking up and being like, oh, my back hurts. <laughs> my legs hurt. My wife is a social worker. So she connects with Jesus on the side of him experiencing trauma and emotional betrayal from his friends and how he can actually help us in our trauma because of that. So how do you connect with Jesus in that way? As Hebrews 2 says, he is not ashamed to call you brother or sister. He's like his brothers and sisters in every way, except for sin, which you'll learn about in chapter 4. But what a beautiful thought. Spend some time pondering on this on your own time. Don't just skirt by this. God is not only a God of power, but a God of humility. He became human. He became that dirt and mud we talked about last week. Jesus sympathizes with us because he has experienced what it is to be human. Because he suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. That's good news. He doesn't push us away. He says, I can relate. So if you look at Matthew 26 and 27, it's Jesus' last days. And I think this narrative actually displays Jesus' humanity in a really real way. I think it's going to show us that he suffered in his body and his mind and his will and his emotions. So at the Garden of Gethsemane, oh, side note, it's not a coincidence that he was in a garden, hmm, Garden of Eden. He was in a garden being tempted to define good and evil on his own terms. Don't miss that. He is being tempted to say, I'm not going to take this cup. So don't miss that. But he doesn't do that. He defines good based on his father's terms. So he's at the garden and he's struggling as a human. 
It says he became sorrowful and troubled to the point of death. His human emotions were just going wild. Can you relate to that? <laughs> I can. He said, my soul was very sorrowful to his friends. Stay up with me and pray. But what did they do? They decided to go to sleep and not be there for him. My wife can relate. I do that all the time to her. And I'm, I'm sad to say that, but I do. He tells God, his father, three times that his will does not want what is coming. Lord, please, this is not, do I have to take this cup? But not my will, but yours. There's that internal clashing of his human will and his divine will. Can you relate? When he's taken before the council, once Judas betrays him in the garden, ironically, the high priest and his friends spit on him, mock him, slander him, slap him. But they didn't know that, as our pastor says tonight, he was the true high priest. <laughs> they didn't know that. And you know the rest of the story. It gets worse. Jesus beat to a pulp, his body not even recognizable, carrying this heavy cross up the hill of Golgotha. And they nailed him to that cross, a weary, beat-up body, his wills clashing internally, his sorrows flooding, and his mind full of questions, one of which he shouts, and this is a quote from Psalm 22, which our author quotes in this passage as well. And he shouts, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus on the cross, separated from his Father. That's where we were supposed to be. Which turns our attention to the second point. What? happened on the cross <laughs> what is this crazy cross idea what happened here well the first thing that happened is atonement so why did jesus and the author of hebrews here quote psalm 22 well in this psalm it starts with this cry of anguish my god my god why have you forsaken me and it continues on and basically the author is saying God, you're not listening to me. He, he says, I'm a worm. I'm not a man. A reproach of men, despised by all people. All who see me sneer. They separate with the lip. They wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to Yahweh. Commit yourself to your Father. Let him deliver you. Or, as I said to Jesus, If you really are the King of the Jews, if you really are the Messiah, then get off the cross, big boy. Let God rescue him. And he also says, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melted within me. The reason it is quoted here and quoted by Jesus is that Jesus experienced this on the cross to atone for you and me. We were supposed to experience what Jesus experienced. Not only death in the end, but the physical, emotional, will, and everything turmoil. <laughs> because the wages of sin is death. And death is not only final. Death is every little thing that happens because of sin. And the author here says that Jesus became human so that he would be a merciful and faithful high priest to make propitiation for our sins. Paul says in Romans 5, we are saved from God's wrath through his blood, through Jesus' blood. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says that Jesus, who knew no sin, remember, became sin on our behalf. Jesus was displayed publicly as a propitiation and atonement for our sin. In short, 
Jesus paid our sin debt that we owed God for forfeiting our vocation and saying, I don't care what you think, God. I'm defining good and evil on my own terms. He paid the debt we owed and took what we deserve, God's wrath. We were destined for death and total separation from God, but Jesus took that on our behalf. We are the ones who should be forsaken by God. We should be crying out, my God, you've forsaken me. Our hearts should be melted like wax. We should be despised like worms. But Jesus in love was put through all of that to offer us salvation. The original plan, restore it all. Invite us back in to be his family. Not to be ashamed of us, but to bring us in. And to say, you're my royal priest again. Here's how Peter puts it. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you were healed. You see, Jesus brings full healing through atonement because he's fully human. Here's what David Mathis says in that article I mentioned earlier. Jesus took a human body to save our bodies. He took a human mind to save our minds. Without becoming man in his emotions, he could not have rescued our hearts. And without taking a human will, he could not save our broken and wandering wills. In the words of Gregory of Nazianzus, that which he has not assumed, he has not healed. Flip that. He has assumed all of what it means to be humanity so he can fully heal you and me. That's good news. That's gospel. And you can read Isaiah 8 through 9, which the author quotes here. You can read Isaiah 53. You can read Psalm 22, the whole thing. And also watch those two Bible Project videos. <laughs> to really understand what's happening on the cross in this atonement. I wish I could keep going into that detail, but on your own time, ponder this propitiation, Jesus taking my place, this atonement of sins. But that's not all Jesus did on the cross. There's another word. Jesus was victorious as the king on the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, the it is the biggest it ever. In Romans 8.3, Paul says that God condemned sin in the flesh of Jesus. So picture this. Sin is the spiritual power just longing to latch on to God himself. God lures this pack of wolves and this beast of sin to Jesus and destroys them all. The full power of sin at war with the full power of love and goodness. And Jesus wins. When Jesus died, sin, evil, and death died with him and stayed buried. Ultimately, Jesus, as Paul says in Colossians 2, 14-15, canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set it aside and nailed it to the cross. <laughs> but not only that, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and put them to open shame, triumphing over them. Jesus was victorious. Jesus nailed sin and debt we owed to the cross. Jesus defeated Satan and all the evil spiritual powers, ironically, on the cross, through death. Jesus stomped that serpent's head on the cross. Hebrews 2.14 says this, Through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, the devil, the serpent, 
and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. And notice the language here, through death. Jesus is the only one who's gone through death and come out on the other side. He rose victorious. That's good news. I love this quote by John of Damascus. By nothing else except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ has death been brought low. The sin of our first parent destroyed, hell plundered, resurrection bestowed, the power given us to despise the things of this world, and even death itself, the road back to former blessedness made smooth. The gates of paradise opened. Our nature, seated back at the right hand of God, royal priests, and we made children, brothers and sisters of Jesus, heirs of God. Catch this. By the cross, all things have been set aright. Jesus has set all things right. Now, we are called to live in that reality. We are called to follow our pioneer. I get the word pioneer from Hebrews 2.10. It says, God made the pioneer or author or founder of our salvation perfect through suffering. Now, before you run on a rabbit trail with the word perfect here, it's not talking about moral perfection. It's talking about the relation from Jesus being equipped to do the task and say, it is finished. In other words, Jesus had to become human, go through suffering to do the task God called him to do. So that's the idea of perfect is to be perfect is to be able to do the task, complete to do the task. So Jesus, the pioneer, was made complete to do the task through suffering. Here's the irony. To follow the victorious Jesus, we must die. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. We must suffer emotionally, physically, in our wills, in our minds. Jesus says, love your enemies. If someone slaps you in the face, turn to them the other cheek. If someone asks you to walk a mile carrying their things, walk another mile. This is not the usual way of living the American dream. <laughs> this is following the pioneer of our salvation, upside down way of life. We're called to follow Jesus' self-sacrificing loving enemies, forgiving everyone that harms you, way of life. As Revelation shows us, the one who's worthy to open the scroll is actually the slain lamb. You see, to be exalted, you must walk through humiliation. Here's how Philippians 2 says it. Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, he did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Catch that. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself, emptied himself, humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death this death on the cross we've been talking about. Therefore, so he did all these things in humility, emptied himself, death on the cross. Therefore, the connection is, God has highly exalted him. Jesus says it this way, those who humble themselves will be exalted, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him, the name that is above every name, 
so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, the whole universe will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's a quote by N.T. Wright that I think sums up the way we live this out. There's a new sort of power that will be let loose upon the world. And it will be the power of self-giving love. This is the heart of the ironic revolution that was launched on Good Friday. You cannot defeat the usual sort of power by the usual sort of means. In other words, you can't fight sword with sword. If one force overcomes another, it's still a force that wins. Rather, at the heart of the victory of God over all the powers, there lies self-giving love. Which, in obedience to the ancient prophetic vocation, will give its life as a ransom for many. So Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder, the pioneer, and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So every day we're given a choice. Every day we're kind of at the garden, at the tree, with a choice. Will we trust this way of life? Will we say that the pioneer's way of life in suffering in humility is actually the most powerful power can get. The most su successful success can get. Will we look to Jesus' humanity and say, you're a merciful and faithful high priest. I want to go to you, not anyone or anything else. Will we see Jesus on the cross in our place and trusting him each day as we die like he did to, to our own will, to our own mind, our own emotions and define what he defines as good? Will we experience the victory of Jesus over sin, death, and evil? Living in freedom, as the text says, knowing that one day, we'll be resurrected in victory just like he was. Triumphing over all, conquering, as Re Revelation says, with Jesus. And if we respond in these ways, Psalm 22 will come true for us. Jesus will call us family. He won't be ashamed. He won't say, oh, get away from me, depart from me, I never knew you. But he'll say, brother, sister, Come, you're my royal priesthood. And we will sing, as the text says in Hebrews 2, we will sing our Father's praise with him in the midst of the congregation of new creation. Let's pray. Lord, what good news. You can sympathize with us. Your humanity makes us just marvel as much as your divinity. You're this paradox worth pondering for a lifetime and longer. And Lord, we're excited to see your resurrected face <laughs> that says, come brother, come sister, and enjoy what you always long for fully. So Lord, I, I pray come quickly. And if not, may our wills Bend to your will always. In Jesus' name, amen.